I do just want to share really the kind of fun fact that really um, we all have in common us on this panel is that we're not only all trained scientists, but we actually overlapped as aging biology researchers at Stanford. And, you know, through our unique expertise and passion towards uh, elucidating underlying mechanisms of aging, we have been able to take those ideas and discoveries to really tackle unique aspects of the aging process in order to shape um, the platforms and the companies that we're, we're building today. Um, so without further ado, I would love um, for each of us to maybe start by sharing a little bit more about ourselves and um, if we can um, please describe in just a few sentences what it is that, you know, our companies, um, each of your company's mission and vision are uh, starting with Ashley. Thanks, Anadu. Thanks for inviting me on the panel. And I'm excited for the conversation today. So as you mentioned, um, I did my PhD at Stanford. Before that, I had done a residency in even exotic medicine uh, at UC Davis uh, for my veterinary career. So I'm kind of this weird hybrid of veterinary clinical training and then sort of more human-focused molecular biology training. And that um, kind of drives a lot of the approach that we take at Sauna Bio. So my co-founders who I met during my postdoc both have human genetics PhDs, but ended up studying one studied hybridation biology, which we'll get into a little more deeply later about why that's important. And the other one studied really comparative genomics and how you use broad evolutionary approaches to look for drivers of disease. So the three of us uh, met during our postdocs at Stanford and realized there was this really untapped opportunity um, to study many, many, many other types of species who have um, really evolved really interesting solutions to human disease problems using a lot of the conserved mechanisms that we see across aging biology um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those um, hallmarks of aging factors and how we think about those a little bit later. Um, but, you know, as it turns out, and, uh, humans are also a form of animal. Uh, and so a lot of the pathways that other uh, species have used to live longer and, and uh, live healthier, uh, we can adapt for human diseases. So that's really what we do at Fauna. We're a genomics biotechnology company. We find our own therapeutics looking specifically at um, mechanisms of natural disease resistance. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Glenn, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, that's a great introduction. So our, um, my research began at Stanford when I was working with my co-founder, John Bermudez, who uh, was investigating the mechanism of telomere shortening and specifically looking for a way to re-extend telomeres, which, of course, one of the, one of the hallmarks of aging. And that's when um, he found that the mRNA approach worked uh, phenomenally well in cells and culture. And so we decided to work together to launch re rejuvenation technologies to bring these types of messenger RNA therapeutics uh, to the market. And so we've been focusing on delivering the uh, telomerase messenger RNA in vivo and looking at other factors that could be implicated as well in, in, the, in, the, in the disease. And so when we started messenger RNA, um, was a relative unknown modality, but now it's you know, growing in the uh, kind of public conscience. And uh, we've made great strides as well, looking at, uh, as, as we'll talk about at, at, on this panel, trying to fit what we're, what we're doing and the discoveries we made uh, at the level of the basic aging biology to a kind of a practical clinical application that can be tackled by a, a small biotech startup. Very excited to hear more during the course of this panel. And, and Mada? Okay, I'm, I'm going to close the circle. I'm uh, Madalena Adorno. I started Dorian Therapeutics uh, four years ago with my co-founder that I also met at Stanford uh, University. She is an uh, immunologist by training. And uh, as a bit of the several of these uh, stories of aging, it's uh, the first discovery that brought me to the aging space was a, a story of a serendipity. And uh, I was working on stem cell biologists. And uh, uh, studying people with Down syndrome, we realized that people with Down syndrome, they uh, undergo accelerated aging. And we found a way to reverse the accelerated aging with people of people with Down syndrome. And that opened a completely new way of thinking about how to treat aging. And we are developing this concept of senoblockers uh, that are approaches to reactivate uh, stem cell pathway and by doing so we are able to uh, block senescence and uh, reactivate the regeneration of a tissue in age-related diseases and i'm sure we will have more time to talk about this later on absolutely mad and then um and i'll also share just a little bit more about sort of my story with juvena where um we actually it really began my journey into the biology of aging when i was at uc berkeley and decided to join the labs of professors dave Schaefer and Irina Conway 
and really just fell in love with the idea that by understanding changes in protein signaling that occur both systemically in blood as well as locally in tissues, we could actually use those changes that underlie the loss of tissue homeostasis and intracellular communication and stem cell exhaustion to target those pathways to rejuvenate our own body's stem cell activity, promote better intracellular communication and promote tissue regeneration and repair. And it was then over a decade of research through um, during my time at Berkeley and then uh, in the lab of Professor Tony West Cray at Stanford that really solidified my desire to want to bring some of those discoveries specifically in the secret tomes of stem cells into um, really a robust approach and really into the clinic through a systematic process through a company and was really also fortunate and serendipitous that I met my co-founder, Dr. Jeremy O'Connell, who is a um, proteomics expert trained in the lab of um, Steve Gigi at Harvard. And uh, we'll also be able to share a little bit more about sort of our story and vision and how we've been able to take our expertise and approach to uh, building a pipeline of biologics for multiple diseases of aging. Uh, and that gets to then the next question, um, which I think I already on my side answered. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more um, from, from you, Glenn, uh, Matt, and Ashley on what are hallmarks of aging that you would consider that your startup is really focused on tackling? And what's that major white space in the fields that you're you're filling with your company? Yeah, sure. Yeah, happy to. As I touched on it a little bit, um, we're uh, primarily focused on uh, telomeres and telomere extension. And so telomeres is our tricky topic because, of course, it was studied mainly uh, predominantly in cancer for a long time because it confers immortality to cells that have telomeres on. Um, of course, our stem cells you know, express telomeres as well and germ cells. And so it's an integral part of biology. And uh, you know, evolution didn't provide us with the telomeres long enough for the lives we're living today. Um, and so a safe way to extend telomeres, I think, was been on people's minds for a long time. But wasn't possible until recently um, because the gene itself is highly regulated. It's hard to develop small molecules to activate it. Delivering it as DNA is potentially risky. And so we, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the mRNA approach really uh, took off because we're able to deliver and uh, modify messenger RNA that encodes the protein polymerase. And the cells um, and the power, the, the uh, modalities that the cells naturally know what to do with that and produce the protein for us. Um, and so, you know, of the hallmarks of aging, that's one that you know, we, we, we found that's um, been working well in terms of both uh, kind of giving the restoration of the biomarker, the telomeres, but also different phenotypes at the cellular level and the organismal level. And really it's where, you know, we're not, uh, we're largely building on the work of many others who have looked into this field and um, found these yeah, epidemiological studies correlating tumor length to different and all cause mortality and um, different incidents of disease. And so um, and it, it's, a, it's allowed us to really just focus and hone in our research on just the translational aspects. Well, that's really fascinating. Um, Ashley, would you like to kind of share what, what your kind of unique approach is for the biology of aging? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, we study a lot of hibernation biology in the course of what we do at Fauna Bio, our CSO is a hibernation biologist. It's really interesting looking at these particular class of mammals um, that, you know, there are hibernators across every group of mammals, including primates, um, that have really adapted their physiology to resist tissue damage in a lot of different ways. And a lot of those conserved mechanisms relate to these sort of classic hallmarks of aging. So just generally, um, biologists have noted that animals that hibernate do tend to live longer. A lot of the longer lived species um, are hibernators. This includes bats, many classes of rodents and others. And they do that through several mechanisms, one of which is slowing epigenetic aging throughout the course of hibernation. Um, there have been examples of animals um, that can elongate telomeres naturally. So lemurs in longitudinal studies can actually add on to their telomeres. But they also have these really highly adaptive ways of dealing with oxidative stress um, and cellular inflammation. And what we see in some of our genetic data and RNA-seq data is that they're able to dial back and sort of get back this kind of stem cell reversion-like traits. Uh, we look a lot at, at cardiac function and some of the hibernating models. They're able to naturally resist essentially the physiological equivalent of 20 to 25 heart attacks over the course of the hibernation cycle, um, which no many other mammals, uh, including humans, can do that. And how do they do that? If you look at them genetically um, and at a kind of RNA and protein level, 
they're actually reverting to sort of more of a more neonatal cardiac state and being able to repair tissues that way as opposed to laying down scar tissue. Um, so there's this idea of kind of reverting, again, some uh, tissues to uh, at least transiently to more of a stem-like state to be able to repair, enhance repair mechanisms. Um, interestingly too, um, hibernators are one of the only species that can maintain um, and regenerate their thymuses. Um, so they're able to maintain uh, thymus biology a lot later in life than many other species so they can regenerate parts of their thymus. Um, and this is something that can also help reduce things like immunosenescence and inflammation. So I wouldn't say that we're focused necessarily on one particular mechanism. We look at a lot of these different mechanisms, but a lot of them kind of cross across multiple species, including human. Yeah, and following up on that, uh, there's a, a bit this uh, misconcept that, that the hallmarks of aging go on independently. Of course, they are very well connecting one with the other. It's most, it's almost impossible to touch one without having an effect also on the other. So it's mostly the entry point on how are we changing the hallmarks of aging that makes the difference. Uh, from our uh, point of view, especially since uh, me and my co-founder, we are stem cell biology. For example, the biology of senescence uh, and the biology of stem cells and exhaustion, it's uh, very uh, tightly regulated together. And uh, uh, a lot of these regulators are also epigenetic regulators. And this is another uh, example of how all these things actually go together. And when we talk about epigenetics, uh, lately we have been this, uh, discussing a lot about uh, epigenetic reprogramming. And that has been one uh, approach uh, um, to rejuvenate tissue. Uh, but for example, what we are doing at Dorian is to not necessarily reprogram uh, the epigenome, uh, epigenome, but we can modulate the epigenome directly. So we can uh, uh, act on uh, epigenetic regulators and this uh, switch the balance between senescence uh, and stem cell activity. So we are able to uh, switch towards a more uh, rejuvenation and uh, youthful uh, activity of these cells. That makes so much sense, Mada. I mean, I couldn't really agree more that, you know, these different hallmarks are all interconnected and it's not just about targeting them as if they were, you know, almost separate chapters of a book, but rather really how is that entry point going to enable the tipping of the balance towards more rejuvenation and regeneration versus degeneration and, um, you know, loss of these homeostatic mechanisms that, that promote health, uh, cellular health. And so that gets um, us really kind of nicely um, into the next um, topic, which is then how are your companies uniquely approaching building an actual pipeline of therapeutics from these really underlying core mechanisms of, of targeting these various, um, you know, uh, hallmarks and, and biology that really promote regeneration and repair. How are you actually turning that into a pipeline of drugs, which is a big question, but um, uh, Ashley, do you want to get started with that? <laughs> Sure, no problem. I think it is the question, right? And literally of this panel, uh, but also in, in real life, right? Um, so, you know, I think for us, we are taking what essentially used to be a fairly stochastic process. Uh, we used to, um, you know, just in terms of um, drug discovery, uh, used to turn a lot uh, to natural biology. And some of our biggest drugs came out of observing extreme phenotypes across species. So things like GLP-1 agonist, um, drugs like... Um, uh, you know, PSK9 inhibitors came out of looking at extreme variation in humans, but you can look at extreme variation across multiple species and find these things are really going to drive disease in a different way. But before it was kind of these, you know, uh, again, more stochastic findings. So what we're doing at FanaBio is really building a platform and a way to mine uh, the genetics and RNA seq and proteomics of these ex more extreme species, match that directly to human disease traits. And so our, our platform is called Convergence, uh, and the knowledge graph that links these two things together is called Centaur, um, fairly appropriately named Centaur. Um, but then using that kind of knowledge graph based approach, we can use um, you know deep neural networks to literally find matches between. The, the genes and proteins that we're finding change in these protected species, look at those conserved proteins and, and RNA in people and say, okay, where do we have genes that are maybe going up at a time point where animals are protected, but they're going down and say maybe human models of heart failure, that gives us more confidence that we're hitting the right pathways. We just need to modulate them in a different way. Um, and so we can either do that through um, more of a genetics focused approach, or we do have the ability through another part of our platform called Leo, um, which takes genetic signatures and matches them to small molecules um, that can replicate that genetic signature 
um, in human cells. Um, so we can go directly to small molecule predictions from the genetic signatures themselves um, and use that to try to replicate some of the protective uh, traits that we're finding in the, in the natural organisms that we study. Um, so it's really about trying to make this process more scalable and repeatable over time uh, and really being able to mine this extreme biology in a more reproducible way uh, and then linking that directly to compounds that can replicate that, that protective trait. Well, that, that really makes a lot of sense. And it, it's really exciting that then you can then translate that into small molecules that can actually modulate those key pathways to, to really take advantage of um, the, you know, the similarity. So that's, that's really fascinating, uh, Ashley. Um, Glenn, and I know you talked a little bit about it with the mRNA approach, but do you want to sort of elaborate on how you're really uniquely using, you know, this modality specifically to, to really then, you know, target certain diseases where telomere extension could be in particular really useful to um, promoting that tissue uh, restoration and repair effect? No, exactly. I think our, our goal has been uh, to try to find the best first targets that um, as, you, as you said, where tumor shortening is implicated in both driving the disease and where we can deliver to, which is not a challenge often with messenger RNA, um, but also one where, um, you know, there is uh, that, that, I guess, that clinical evidence and also uh, biological evidence that, um, and so the ones we've been focusing on as uh, these phenotypes that appear in people with this keratosis congenita, which is a very rare disease, um, uh, is um, m has many manifestations and it arises from mutations in telomere maintenance genes. Um, and those, the main three sort of uh, fatal aspects of the disease include bone marrow failure, um, pulmonary fibrosis, and, and liver uh, cirrhosis. And so those latter two, uh, we have uh, nanoparticles that are able to target the messenger RNA to those tissues uh, wow. and extend those telomeres. And so that for us is uh, a way to... Uh, get the um, modality through the steps of the, um, you know, the, the different uh, milestones in clinical development and to uh, get it to the patients that need it. Um, and of course, the, the dream would be to extend telomeres throughout the body in a way that would sort of restore function. Um, and I think the immune system is another good one to focus on um, and uh, partly limited by technology and partly because, you know, bandwidth and you want to, um, you know, develop your pipeline onto things that have uh, kind of the easiest path forward. And, and really there's the multiple variables to consider there um, in terms of the, the indication, the delivery modality, what, uh, what people have done before in that field. Um, and so uh, we're, we're currently, as I mentioned, we're focused on the liver and lung primarily. Um, and most of our data have, have, have come in that, in, in those two realms. Um, and so for us, yeah, that's been, that's been our, uh, focus is to have multiple indications where we can show that, that similar results where tumors are extended and regenerative capacity is restored. And the idea is that um, it would translate well in, in, uh, in patients where this has um, been, been strongly linked to the disease progression. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. Would you also say that, you know, developing these mRNAs and targeting them to these specific organs that technology in and of itself and sort of approach to delivering the telomere extension, you know, therapeutic benefit is a major maybe focus in terms of, you know, sp tissue specific therapies. Absolutely. I think the, um, the delivery technology is really one A, one B when it comes to what we're doing. And of course, you know, the um, applicability is beyond delivering a specific messenger RNA, which is how we start out. Our focus is you can deliver other messenger RNAs, potentially targeting other um, either pathways or exactly. you know, something synergistic. So um, that's and and part of our approach has been also to collaborate and to talk to folks who are delivering the these new modalities for other organs that we may not have been able to do before and um, see if they're interested because typically they're de delivering it. Uh, they're de developing those technologies for many applications, and we have you know, maybe a specific one. So. That's, that's really, really exciting. And hold that thought because I definitely do want to make sure we talked a little bit upon how we are going about kind of partnerships and collaborations to really ensure that our, our drugs can get to market as quickly and as cost effectively as possible. But I, I love that, that, um, that thought, but I would definitely want to also give um, Matt and then I'll also share a little bit more about um, how, you know, you're uniquely really building that pipeline towards 
you know, um, specific diseases, but, you know, taking this kind of key underlying core mechanism of, right, the seno blockers and really moving that kind of balance between stem cells and, and senescence towards a more regenerative phenotype. How is that translating to the actual sort of drug modality or um, uh, th like therapeutic approach you're taking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are working uh, simultaneously on a platform and on a pipeline. So from one side, uh, uh, again, I was mentioning that uh, Down syndrome really uh, taught us a lot uh, about how aging works and uh, what are important parts way for aging. So from there, we were able to develop a number of uh, small molecules targeting the specific epigenetic regulator. And we have been seeing that across multiple uh, indications and multiple diseases, uh, the therapeutic effect, uh, it's always there. So we, we, we can look at multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer, osteoarthritis, uh, kidney disease, and we see a therapeutic benefit. So we are building a, a pipeline around this, uh, this a specific target uh, that we discovered in Down syndrome. And apart from this, again, for us, uh, the core concept of senoblockers is that you don't want to um, focus only on senescence, but the aspect of regeneration and stem cell content is also very important. So we have a, a proprietary platform to identify new senoblockers, and we do functional testing based on stem cell content and senescence at the same time. So when we have a double hit, something that acts on both these processes, we have something that is worth for us pursuing. This goes again to the concept that the all marks of aging are not independent, and depending on the disease, depending on the tissue, depending on the age, there's a, the, the combination that really matters to have a therapeutic benefit changes. So it, it's, it's, it's about the fit uh, for the disease, not uh, that the one is more important than the others. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, you know, there's just so much to do. I feel like where, you know, uh, yeah, being able to kind of tackle these different diseases and then the underlying mechanisms and the different ways in which these different um, cell types are interacting and how the balance is, is impacting the ultimate kind of homeostatic effects and health of the tissue to then translate that into a specific therapy for a disease is, um, it's just fascinating how we're all really tackling that. Um, and at Juvena, you know, the way that we're really approaching this is that we're turning stem cell secreted proteins into therapies by specifically mapping their pathways and the ways in which targeting dysregulated protein signaling between cells can restore homeostasis, which, um, you know, along the lines and the themes that it's, you know, there's not one drug that fits all. It's really about actually at Juvena, we're taking this computationally driven approach to build a map of secreted protein biology linking proteins that are enriched in secret tomes of, for example, pluripotent and multipotent stem cells that are enriched for their trophic and immunomodulatory potential, we're mapping those proteins to the receptors that they're binding to and the disease-modifying phenotypes they're inducing across multiple therapeutic areas to ultimately establish um, this map where we can identify key drivers of organ-specific rejuvenation and then engineer those secreted proteins either into drugs uh, as biologics or even develop antibodies and other form of biologics targeting their receptors to modulate those pathways and restore systemically tissue homeostasis. And so um, what I would also kind of um, like to chat a little bit more about is, you know, for um, those of us that are really using this machine learning and computationally driven approach to kind of building our compounding databases and platforms, um, Ash, I'm thinking of you because you mentioned, you know, deep neural networks and especially with um, genomics and really mapping, you know, those uh, the, the genetic changes you're seeing in, in hibernating animals and really animals with extreme phenotypes that enable them to, sur um, to survive really extreme conditions, how you're actually matching that through this um, approach and through machine learning and AI to therapies for humans. Can you share a little bit more about, you know, how you're using those models and um, how your platform works computationally in that respect? Yeah, so I think for us, it's more about linking different kinds of data together. Um, and so it's really how we put that data together. It allows us to really get new insights from the data than you could if you looked at any one particular species independently or any one particular data set. Um, so I've kind of given this analogy before, but, you know, a lot of people think about using AI and ML as a way to kind of sift data faster um, and using large, 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 large amounts of data, we end up thinking about it more as like kind of building a better magnet to find that needle in the haystack and really analyzing data more precisely and in the correct way and getting the right insights out of it. So for us, it's really about linking um, things like transcriptomic data, 
whole genome conservation scores, um, uh, disease enrichment scores for human diseases, um, uh, genomic hits from uh, resources like the UK Biobank, um, and then uh, drug and deal information as well. What are the drugs that are uh, available that are going through clinical trials? Um, you know, and linking all that data together in a way that we can say, okay, we have this genetic signature that we need to, we need to replicate that we know is protective. Um, does that match human genetic signatures? Does that link to a drug um, that's either discontinued or, or is, you know, gone through some safety testing? Um, and so it's, you know, through that, you kind of more of like a graph-based ML, right? And so it's a, trying to try to find new associations um, that we couldn't necessarily find by saying, looking on PubMed or, or talking to a bunch of KOLs, right? It's trying to be able to get those insights more quickly, more rapidly, and being able to then validate that with additional external data sets. So we curate a lot of external data aside from what is on, uh, in, even in our own biobank that we own of, of samples that we, we do our, use for RNA-seq. So we've got, you know, well over, you know, 160 other external data sets, mostly transcriptomic and proteomics across multiple, I think it's 30 plus species now that we use to help validate the, the findings that we have from a lot of the work we do is in 13-line ground squirrel. It's the prototypical hibernation species. And that's what the biobank is based on. Now mm -hmm. we're starting to expand on other species as well. Um, so that's one part of how we use um, ML is really this graph page approach to finding new disease associations. Um, but then also, as I mentioned before, more computational um, compound predictions. So once we have, there's two ways to think about that. There's, we have 20 or 30 genes that we know we need to change. Can we find a compound that when you treat human cells sort of matches that signature? It's a kind of a a version of drug repurposing where in humans, you try to usually reverse a genetic signature with the drug. We're just trying to match it here directly. Um, but also if you have a specific genetic target that you know um, is protective, can you computationally predict small molecules that might inhibit that and be able then to reduce the amount of uh, wet lab screening you have to do on the bench if you can narrow the universe of those compounds down computationally. Um, so I say those are the two areas that we, we tend to be more computationally ML focused is in this linking to human disease through this graph, graph ML theory, and then also this computational drug predictions. No, I, I love that, Ashley. And, I, you know, I find it not only just so fascinating, but it's really interesting that, you know, even at Juvena, it's kind of those two approaches, but more applied to protein drug discovery that, that we're really using and in integrating machine learning techniques, right? Where on the one side, it's integrating multiple data modalities. For us, it's proteomics, transcriptomics, and image-based data modalities, both from data sets generated in-house through our, you know, RNA-C proteomics experiments of, of mining seeker tomes, as well as image-based screening assays with also public knowledge to build those disease, um, you know, protein associations and really also yeah. kind of that links to potentially really target identification. But then, you know, we're also kind of like you really integrating machine learning and deep learning techniques to really speed up and integrate that into every step of the process. And we've actually dubbed um, our machine learning and computational tools JuveNet, which is sort of a compilation of both machine learning and computational tools that we integrate both into in silico predictions of key drivers of protein, uh, rejuvenating proteins that are driving organ specific um, regeneration or particular disease modifying phenotypes through to then integrating um, deep learning tools into the human phenotypic screening assays to really improve the ability to predict, but then get um, really robust and unbiased quantitative data, and then integrate these tools also into the in vivo target validation, as well as lead optimization. Truly, really, you know, in the end of the day, you know, we look at computation and deep learning and machine learning as a way that can really just advance all stages of drug discovery, right? And it's, I think, going to be really the next wave for, for many of our companies where it's not just saying you're a machine learning enhanced or machine learning driven platform. It's how can you really use these next generation techniques to take advantage of the multi-omics data modalities that the latest technologies are, you know, enabling us to generate, you know, at our fingertips now um, to build these predictions and to screen much more cost effectively and predictively and build these compounding really proprietary but unique databases, right? Mm -hmm. Knowledge databases that, that yeah. make it, you know, us more predictive and, and more capable of building this pipeline as we go. Yeah. And then every time you add more data sets to that, right, it learns more. Um, I think it's interesting. People think of us as solely an animal genomics company, uh, which we are largely an animal genomics company, but we've actually kind of curated like how much human data is on convergence. It ends up being about 40% of the data that we integrate in the knowledge graph is human-based data. Again, humans are animals, right? Uh, but people do think of them as distinct. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of people, uh, people are surprised to find out how much of the data on the platform is human, because that's really what we're linking to at the end of the day. 
Awesome. Awesome. Ashley, there's five minutes to go. And there's a few more um, questions I'd love for us to touch upon that I think is going to be, you know, really important for the audience and just for us to learn from one another. So, so the first is um, how do you think about selecting the right initial indication for therapeutics that target mechanisms of aging, given it's, you know, it's not always just about the science, but it's also about the market and actually getting these drugs successfully funded into the clinic. And so I'd love to hear, you know, a sentence or two, just given the time, because I do want to cover that in one or two more questions, um, how you're going about it. Uh, starting with Mada, because <laughs> you're the one. Yeah. Guy. So uh, as you say, there's the uh, this is the intersection of two very different uh, uh, reasons to choose one indication over another. Of course, the the biology and the science uh, always needs to win because uh, that's uh, that's what we absolutely need for something to actually work. But then there is an appetite for like a disease over another disease, and these also change very rapidly. The diseases that were uh, uh, kind of in vogue uh, like a few years ago now are different from the one uh, that uh, people care about right now. Just to make an example, in the uh, in the aging space, osteoarthritis was considered a very interesting indication to go after. And uh, but since there has been a failure from Unity with their senolytics. Uh, also, the, the risk profile of this disease uh, uh, is perceived in a different way from the community. Um, so in, uh, in our case, we are anyway going after osteoarthritis <laughs> as one of our indications. Our other indication is kidney disease. And uh, we identify some uh, rare disease in the kidney disease space to, to go after. So I, I think uh, the, for us, it's very interesting to follow up on this. It helped a lot the, uh, the NIH is actually recognized the importance of treating uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, so it has been supporting us with a, with a grant uh, that help us develop the preclinical uh, studies in, uh, in this space. That's really helpful, Matt. And, and um, how about you, Ashley? I know that you also kind of have a unique story, you know, that, that I would love to hear in terms of you, your process for indication selection and what you've learned kind of growing the company. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief because I know I've, I've talked too much in this panel, but um, no, briefly, we started looking at more acute cardiac indications primarily because acute cardiac protection is a really key phenotype that we observe, particularly in the small uh, rodent, small bodied hibernators, they can protect their hearts really exquisitely from damage. Um, it turns out that acute coronary disease is a rather difficult clinical indication to develop. Um, just because of the uh, graveyard of failures in that indication space, not a lot works. There's a huge high unmet need, uh, but everybody has been scared away from looking at that indication specifically. Um, so we then sort of took a lot of feedback from KOLs and, and talking to lots of folks in pharma with programs in heart disease and have now started taking a similar type of data, but a slightly different approach and looking more at fibrosis and repair um, and how these animals can resist um, developing fibrosis from re repeated cycles of inflammation and damage and more chronic um, heart function and less acute heart disease and also looking more pulmonary disease. So now we have our lead program um, in IPF uh, and also uh, some aspects of pulmonary hypertension, um, which is a much more tractable set of these, these areas, but still is kind of hypoxia responsive and comes out of some of the similar cardiac networks, but just in a different disease area. So I think um, getting a lot of feedback early, talking to a lot of KOLs, talking to folks in pharma about their prior experiences in disease areas was very educational for us. Um, and a little bit of a painful lesson uh, that we learned in terms of just getting feedback very early in terms of tractable therapeutic areas. Yeah. Glenn, I know you guys are working also in the pulmonary space, it sounds like. Right. Yeah. We, we started off working in the liver um, uh, fibrosis cirrhosis area. And a couple years back, 2018, that was a really a 2017, a heyday for NASH <clears throat> and these other types of fibrotic liver diseases with a lot of companies getting in there. And as uh, Matt says, and you were saying things change quickly. And I think the appetite for liver fibrosis uh, has died down and um, pulmonary fibrosis was the thing that people were interested in. So uh, we went out and had to develop uh, another delivery technology to deliver to the lung. Um, and so exactly, we've, we've, we've pivoted a lot of our research, uh, having done a lot initially on liver to now focusing on the pulmonary side as well. Got it. And then, and Juvena's, you know, story, and, and this is definitely a theme I think we're all going to be seeing as, as we grow our companies and really break barriers and, and develop our pipelines is for us, we wanted to go after just age-related muscle wasting and sarcopenia um, as our, one of our first indications, building the platform, validating the platform. We actually have a great lead fusion protein therapeutic that is now funded by Serum on its way to a Prandi FDA meeting, but for a rare orphan muscle wasting disease called myotonic dystrophy type 1, 
where it's the same drug that works for sarcopenia and a lot of age-related muscle wasting um, uh, indications as well as, as injury related, but it's also working really well for certain dystrophies. And we found through talking to KOLs and talking to investors that it makes sense to really, um, really get to the clinic by going after um, a smaller indication with a, you know, patient registry with foundations that really support it with then, you know, smaller, shorter clinical trials with much more clear endpoints, patient um, exclusion, inclusion criteria, and importantly, cost to actually get approval that we're hoping to use as a way of, of course, treating a huge unmet need as the largest muscular dystrophy um, with no, no FDA approved therapeutic, but then as a stepping stone to really validate the platform and start expanding and even um, repurposing some of the same drugs or just as a POC to be able to go after some of these larger age-related indications where there's just huge unmet and medical need as we're all seeing, but just not a lot of funding um, or appetite from big pharma to advance those through complicated and lengthy clinical trials. Um, we have four minutes to go and I, you know, I definitely do wanna leave um, questions, um, to, uh, an opportunity to answer questions from the audience if Oliver has any, but my one last closing question then, one sentence each person is, um, how do you go from treating a specific age-related disease to ultimately treating aging itself? You know, how are each of us sort of thinking about that process? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go. And uh, <laughs> so what's, uh, as, as we know right now, it's not possible to start clinical trial for aging. Uh, they are trying with uh, metformin to start a clinical trial in that direction. But uh, we know also that this space is developing quickly and things will be coming. So how can we be ready for how the things will evolve in a few years? Uh, the way I'm thinking about this is that uh, in whatever clinical trial that we are doing in, uh, for a, a, a specific disease, it's important to have secondary biomarkers that are related to aging. So that are not specific for the disease, but they are more broad and can give you a hint about what's happening in the other tissues. So if we keep collecting this uh, uh, biomarker data, uh, then we can reach a point where we can say, okay, we can see this in the first disease. We use the same drug in a second disease and we also see a benefit in another age-related diseases. And we can at one point extrapolate from this that it's worth trying this uh, across multiple diseases. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Ben? Here's what I, what I would say is kind of echo that. With, you see this with metformin, as you're saying, with cancer drugs, that once something's on the market, then the rest of the world can take those medicines and, and, and use them and test them. And um, our goal to translate to the broader aging, uh, which has uh, been our motivation from the start, has been to get something in, you know, approved that you can get you know, human data on, accumulate that evidence, as Matt was saying, that it's, it's doing something broadly. Physicians can prescribe it. You know, at that point, off-label, if necessary, you can have other trials to, to find other uh, broader indications and slowly kind of build, build, build it out on the basis of just the accumula accumulation of data over time. And the only way to do that is to get something approved first, because until then, it's, it's a high bar for anyone else to, to, to take that on. So. Thanks. Yeah, and I think, I think for us, you know, we tend to see two different patterns. We'll see uh, prote protective genetic networks that seem to be active within a specific tissue and that are more narrowly focused. But then we find some mechanisms that seem to be replicating across every tissue that we sequence. Um, and those tend to be more um, kind of broadly applicable means of protection. Again, reduction of inflammation, uh, stem cell reversion type networks. Um, and again, you know, kind of like Matt was talking about, I think if you start getting these things into the clinics and you start, you know, measuring other markers of, ALT, uh, of aging and frailty um, and these types of either clinical markers or biomarkers, um, and then you can start to say, okay, where might this have a use across a more disease agnostic um, set of, of markers? Um, so I think it's just trying to get things in the clinic, as you talked about, Hanadi, and these more rare genetic disorders is a path that a lot of us are, are taking. Um, but then taking all the data that we can get um, from from animal trials and also from human trials to see how they might be more broadly applied. Uh, but it's going to be a, a stepwise uh, solution, I think. Absolutely. Echo the same thing in terms of, you know, wanting to take therapies that are approved for certain indications that could translate to, you know, other therapeutic areas and really getting those biomarkers and data to that, that shows evidence. And then at Juvenile also, you know, that and kind of to echo Ashley, that sometimes there are certain kind of therapeutics that are really unique to certain um, therapeutic areas, uh, or I'd say target tissues. 
And by building this map, linking proteins ultimately to every tissue in the body that they can induce disease modifying effects and promote regeneration and rejuvenation, it's our goal to ultimately achieve a more personalized method and approach for whole systemic rejuvenation that can really take into account uh, folks' genetics, backgrounds, their unique, you know, hallmarks of um, or accelerated versions of aging leading to various diseases um, to create that robust whole systemic uh, rejuvenation pipeline. So with that, this was such a great panel. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, Ashley, and Glenn for really a, a just very enjoyable discussion.